that's uh, got, the, uh, got the juices flowing, well done. It takes balls to play a game like that. So thanks everyone for uh, a great session this morning. Let's continue that conversation on. Now let's start thinking a little bit more about where we're going to be. The, the future is almost impossible to predict. Um, even on Monday we couldn't have predicted some of the future. So today we're going to talk to some, uh, some future seekers and some future uh, thinkers about where we're going to be in the next few years. So Kathy Graham from See It Out Back is going to speak in just a moment. I'm going to do a little bit of an intro for her. Um, Simon Kay and Paul Archie are also going to join us. You can look them up in the guide and learn all about them, but I'll say a few more words before they get up. All right, let's get you in the mood. Um, Andrew McAvoy, mentioned before, um, reminds us that the global tourism environment is increasingly competitive. It's going to get more and more competitive as our, as our overseas rivals learn from us, borrow from us, steal from us, compare to us, and, uh, and steal a little bit of what makes us special. Just a little reminder, since 1987, when, uh, uh, when Uluru Katajuda National Park was inscribed as a World Heritage Area, there have been more than 600 World Heritage Areas inscribed since that date, and more than 150 of those are in the natural category. So our cadence, our, our kudos around the World Heritage listed site is slowly but surely being crowded by other destinations. We can no longer just say we are a World Heritage Area or we have a World Heritage Asset in our backyard. We now need to say what about it makes it special and makes it stand up on the world, in, on the world stage. China itself has now more than 50 World Heritage Areas um, and they're growing fast. Myanmar or Burma, um, as the government will, will uh, s provide some stability in the next few years, have another 30 World Heritage Areas that are going through the consideration process. So something we've traded on and talked about for many years is something we need to think uh, more seriously about. Uh, Lonely Planet did a survey back in 2011 of its members and it said, what do you consider destinations that provide real value? We know that value is uh, a term used a lot in this world. It is not about price, let's be really clear about that. Value is about value for time, value is about brag value and value is also about value for money. Uluru and Alice Springs didn't, didn't set up too well on the value equation against some of our international competitors. So how do we reinvigorate the value that our customers see in our experience, particularly our younger customers, um, those who would respond to the Lonely Planet? I mentioned before the work that EC3 has been doing in Mexico, um, a destination who has some significant social challenges and is taking a, a big picture view of their future. Singapore, on the other hand, we've just come back um, from signing a national agreement with the Singapore Polytechnic to work with every school student in Singapore to embrace tourism, first and foremost, and to embrace the future that they have in sustainable business events. Singapore's already one of the world's leaders in the business events market, but it knew that if it just stood there doing nothing for the next 10 years, then they would slowly but surely be pipped on the post by every other destination, modelling, copying and stealing their approach. So they've taken a new approach, which is to embrace their community, embrace school students, and get them actively participating, not only in tourism, but also in their future as a, as a sustainable tourism destination. And Macau, home of uh, casinos, home of casinos making $360, uh, $360 million of profit a quarter each on average. And that destination just employed the PARTA task force, the Pacific Asia Tourism Association task force, to say, we won't be making that much money for very long. There is an enormous competition in the casino market. Help us redefine Macau so that in 10 years' time, the customers of tomorrow will be giving us more of a description of Macau than casino full stop. Where's our culture? Where's our heritage? And a program they want to call the authentic Macau. Where's the authentic Macau in the story? And how do we get, back, how do we get that back into the marketplace? So I think we can all draw a little bit of inspiration from those that are in trouble and those that are doing well to say you never get a chance to rest on your laurels, you never get a chance to stop and wait, you always have to keep moving and our speakers today are going to talk to us a little bit about how we might go about doing that. A couple of things, just some trends that you might be interested in. For years we've been talking about this rapid increase in growth in outbound holidays, Australians taking holidays overseas. You know that eight years ago, um, it took the average Australian um, about nine years or ten years to take an overseas trip. Today, the average Australian takes an overseas trip between every two and three years. That's all 20 million of us 
individually. So some of us are taking three and four overseas trips a year. But in the last six months, we've finally seen the trending down of consumer confidence, trend down the growth in overseas, outback hol overseas um, holidays. I've seen Andrew McAvoy talk about some work they've done with their inbound tour operators, saying that Australians are starting to tire of the rigour and rigmarole of overseas travel, and they're looking for competitor destinations domestically. And we've seen some good numbers domestically in the last quarter's results. So how do we start to get our share of that growing market who have travelled extensively overseas and are now looking to compare and contrast and share the experience locally? There's a number of social trends we need to keep our eye on. Um, that idea of connection, something you offer extensively here, especially here. You talk about the people, you talk about the connection. Your customers are looking for that connection. Safe adventure, almost an oxymoron. Um, but People around the world feel that they're surrounded by cotton wool. So how do we start to get out and get the heart racing? How do we start to see adventures that I'm going to make it home from, but I'm going to have an adventure? How do we start to position this destination as owning that space? What about the authentic and the exotic? The health and the wellness that everyone talks about, the work-life balance, or as my wife reminds me, that's work-wife balance that you have to remember. And the focus on sustainability. Increasingly, we have less resources at our disposal. We know we'll be short on water, we'll be short on food. Energy prices are rising. Everyone is aware of these things. And when they go on holidays, they don't want to be guilted out about it. But they do want to say, how do I know that you're making sure that's OK so that I can have the holiday that I'm looking for? You look after the sustainability, and I'll look after having fun on holidays. There's a number of markets over the last three years that have demonstrated well above average growth, from the indulgent through to the adventurous, the drive market is finally starting to get a kick along in Australia. Our cruise tourism, which in central Australia might seem a little strange thing to mention, but one of the growth markets in cruise is overlanding, getting off the ship, getting into the interiors of these destinations and then getting back on at a different port. So why and how are we making the opportunity um, available to us. Education is one that was mentioned and one for the Northern Territory that has shown some real growth in the last couple of years. How do we make the most of that looking forward to our future? In the 60 seconds it would take me to explain this slide, um, all of those things would have happened. Um, 98,000 tweets would have occurred, um, 700,000 Googles, most of those, you know, you know the most popular Google search on Google? Google, that's right. <laughs> Most people Google Google on Google. Um, 70 people will register a new domain. Which one is yours? You know, there are billions of websites out there. Having a website is no longer a way to reach your customer. Um, all of those things will have happened in the time that it took me to explain that slide. And this is a little product we're working with um, over in Sweden called the Mirrorball Hotel. It will be a collection of 15 fully mirrored boxes so that from the outside you will not be able to see them. They will be completely invisible from the outside of the site and only as you arrive you will see the, um, the walkways that bridge these uh, mirror cube hotels. This is the sort of idea that is inspiring not only the wealthy but the aspirational in us all. So let's get a little bit of aspiration from, um, from a speaker, Cathy Graham, who's from See It Out Back. Um, Cathy's of course got more than 20 years, or nearly 20 years experience here, a passionate advocate for the centre, comes along to most of the sessions when we talk about how do we make it better, how do we continue to improve. So Cathy, I'm looking forward to hearing from you and how we can improve here in the centre. Give her a round of applause. Well, good morning. What a great morning it's been so far already. It's quite exciting. And um, I'll try and work this gadget. The future of our Red Centre, it's in our hands. We're the ones, and only the ones, that can make the future what we want it to be. I've generally gone around and spoken to quite a few people since I've been asked to be part of the panel to get some ideas, some feedback of where people think we are and what we'll be about. Where will we be in five years? Where will your business be? Where will you be personally? All of those are interconnected. Most of you know what we've been talking about this morning. Most of you hear it all the time, but it's now time to actually action it. Has Australia priced itself out of the market, especially us in the Red Centre? That is one of our biggest questions. 
What are people saying about the Red Centre now? Visitors' numbers are down? Yes, they are. We've been down for the past in May up to 19% at Uluru and 25% in Alice Springs. Great news today that there we are, numbers are going back up. No airline competition. That's causing a lot of dramas, a lot of people's questions to government and to the, the aviation industry of why haven't we got another airline in Alice Springs. Qantas flights were cut in half from Cairns to Uluru, totally taken out by Perth. These changes all have effect on our business. A great economic downturn. Our world is still economically unstable. How do we work with these things? How do we change them? Is this the way life is going to be in the future? I don't think so. I think we need to start crowing about the good things that we see in the Red Centre, what it offers. We need to take the bad and find the positive. So I think it's about time we brag about our business. We brag about it to your staff, you brag about it to each other, and therefore you brag it about it to the outside world. Unless you're positive about your own community, no one else is going to be positive for you. So let's look at some of the good things. We've got some great operators in the NT that work really, really well together in an amazing region. And after travelling through Australia, I believe the Outback and Alice Springs, the Red Centre, Uluru, all our operators work really closely together. I believe as an example, there's a huge piece of pie and every business has an opportunity to take this piece of pie. No one's a competitor. We're all in it together. We want people to visit our region. It's like the dress shops in New York. They're all on one street. They're all trying to get the business in their door. But each of the dress shops offers something different. They might, they might offer the same a hotel. They might offer a touring company. They offer some similar businesses, but each of them have their unique difference. And that's why everybody comes into the door and takes a look at each shop and shops within each one. So let's open our doors and open our oppor the opportunities to the outsider to shop in each of our shops or each of our businesses. Take a piece of the pie. There's enough here for everybody in Alice Springs. Shopping and giving this piece of pie allows people to go back with a complete experience because as you know, we're all very different. We do different things, we like different things. So every experience we can offer, people will take away and tell others. They will then come for more and better experiences. So as Mike said this morning, we also need to hunt as a pack. We need to keep finding those opportunities for our region, not just our individual businesses, but, our, but for, for our complete region. So let's move forward. Now, there is a reason why, and I'm sure most of you know, but can someone tell me the reason why on our coat of armour, our forefathers are put a kangaroo and an emu? Grant? Exactly. Did everybody hear that? They can't move backwards. So remember that. Alice Springs, that's our coat of armour as well. Let's keep looking forward. It's an in, as an industry, we must remember... We don't think about what's happened, what's in the past, what's behind us. We need to utilise those to move to the future. So let's move forward. Let's move forward as a team in a great community. Let's work with what we have right now. So no looking back. Look at what we've got. Look what's coming into Alice Springs. Look what we've got for the Red Centre. Look at this amazing region. And as Gideon said, we do have issues in the Red Centre. We all know about that but let's look forward and to utilise them to our best advantage. We, ha we have, let's go for, uh, we have a unique region. Why are we the real outback? We have beautiful areas to visit, some of the most spectacular in the world, I believe. We have specialised itineraries that we can offer everyone. We've got real characters, so many. Each of you are your own character. Aboriginal culture, how lucky are we? we can share a whole new world to those that don't understand it. European history, we've got so much here, so much of it's hidden. Let's build on these opportunities. Let's let them grow. This is the only way that we can move forward into the future. We have so many business types, as I said, in Alice Springs, the hotels, the conferences, the conference centres, the parks, 
Let's move them all together as a unity to move forward to the future. How are we going to do that? We're going to promote the region as a whole and share it with the world. Send some good news stories, as Kate spoke about. Be an ambassador for the region. Region first, then business. Be positive about your own business, always. Send good news stories. Send them to your friends. Send them to the media. Send them to Tourism NT. They'll make them out further. The only way we can do it is be positive ourselves. Use your eye-catching images. Where else can you see in the world such beautiful drops outside a window, your window of your hotel? You've got these beautiful regions, mountains, water holes, this amazing Uluru and Katajuda. No one else, I believe, in the world can offer what we can, along with all the characters of our amazing region, to share stories. Share them on YouTube. It's a scary thing, the social media. Work, work closely with Tourism NT and industry partners. Jump on their tails because they've got the money to spend. They're spending it for us. Jump on theirs and innovate your business by jumping on their coattails. Don't expect them to do it for you. You are in your business. You create your own business. So empower yourself with industry knowledge. Attend industry updates so you know what's going on in your world. So you can sell your region. Join meetings, the walkabouts that Tourism Central Australia offer. Learn about other businesses. Remember, you've got a pie to share. So empower yourself with knowledge because knowledge is power. As I keep saying, it's your business. You're in control of your own business. You're in control of your own department. You're in control of your own job. Speak out, share your ideas, work together. Work on your business. Don't be swallowed by it. As someone said before, look, work on top of your business or not just in your business. Be the bird's eye view for your own business. Invest in your business. It is your business. It is your region. It is your livelihood. Source help when you need it. A lot of people are very scared of our social media. Ask for help. Don't expect that you can do it on your own. That's what our industry is all about. And moving together, understanding the resources we have, is how we'll get there. Knowledge sharing, knowledge acquisition and knowledge generation. They all come in and keep flowing into each other. The future of marketing. Is it all just about the new markets, the new way of doing things? Or is, have we forgotten the traditional methods? China, we've all heard about it. We all know about it, but will it work? Will it work for your business or will your business work for it? Yes or no, they're your answers. It's your business, you know what to do. Do we change our business to suit this upcoming market? Do we change the food? Do we shorten our tours? Do we get better hotels? Adventure touring, do we offer more? Do we offer enough? Bigger casinos? The question is up to you. Do we adopt the market to fit our business? Or do we ma make our business fit the market? Do they want us to create a mini China for visitors? Or should we be showcasing the great experiences of the Red Centre and what we can offer? The answer is up to you. So these are the key points. Listen, listen to other industry partners and customers. Take on both negative and positive. This will help your business grow into the future. Learn from what you've experienced. Learn from others. As they said this morning, learn from what other countries like New Zealand are doing and how they're winning. Think smart. Implement. As Jeff said this morning, you, it's 48, 7, 30. Implement it. Take with what you've got today. It's okay to listen and learn, but your business will not grow if you don't implement the changes. Social media, we're all talking about it. Are we all scared of it? Do we know enough about it? Do you think the demographics across the board will always be reliant on social media and be savvy to social media? Will this be the outcome of where we all will head? Will we have just cyber-based relationships with our customers? Will this make us where we're going? Should we have just website inclusions for all our brochures? Will people just only book on the website? 
don't lose sight of the bigger picture. One day they will realise that what we're missing is human contact. Already this morning I heard someone say, I think it was Gideon, it's great to put your, your name to the face. We live too much via email. Don't forget your traditional methods. And we can get this human contact, I believe, in Alice Springs with all the characters that we have here to share. So is social media important to your business? Yes or no? Only you can decide. If you're not sure how social media works and what is going to work for your business, then ask. There are sessions today on social media. Make those questions that you've always wondered. Ask them today. Find out more. If you can do social media, you can tweet. Share it with somebody who can't. It's not just somebody asking, it's giving back. It's so important to continue and make Alice Springs an amazing future. So as I said, don't forget the good old fashioned meetings and building relationships. That just doesn't mean with your clients. That just doesn't mean with the agents that are booking your clients. That means with each other. Because the only way we can move forward via not just internet, social media, building relationships, is together. You can only get out of your business what you put into your business. You'll only get out of the town what you put into the town. So, innovate, invigorate and inspire. And while you're doing it, don't forget to have fun and smile because that's what attracts more people than any, any social media will ever do. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. Um, just a quick one. The social media is a really interesting one, and we're going to have some more time this afternoon. But is there anyone brave enough to put their hand up to say, I don't use it, but I'd like to? Quick show of hands. Look at you. So everyone in this room is using social media? Yeah? Oh, you, what was that? That's a would like to? Is that the, the hand that went up next to the camera there? I'm looking at you, looking away. Turn, turn back around. There you go. Hello. <laughs> don't use it, but would like to? Do you use it? You're using it? And working for you? Yeah, tell us a little bit about what you do with it. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting tale. We, um, we talk a lot about social media as though it's a kind of new form of the brochure, but it's not. It's the exact opposite. The customer wants the opposite. They actually want to hear your story. They want the short, personal, human angle. We, we call it word of mouth. Um, it's just the old word of mouth through a new medium. It just means you can tell your story not just around the campfire, but you can tell it to campfires all around the world at exactly the same time. Um, so it can be a really powerful tool if you think about it as a conversation, not as a kind of traditional marketing tool that you're trying to push your story out through. So Cathy, tell us a little bit about how you're using social media. Um, our social media, we have, um, of course, a website. We have Facebook as well. We have Facebook as well. We have a direct booking system onto our website. We use Google Words. We use Google AdWords. I'm sorry, but I'm not into tweeting. I'm not a tweeter at all. There's parts of the business that you've had, I always find that we had to find a purpose for. Don't just have a Facebook site, have a purpose for it. And a lot of people use Facebook, but they don't have a reason or a, 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 some goals behind it. But I also, I'm very sorry, I'm a very strong believer in relationship building face to face, looking people in the eye and getting them excited and being able to show how excited you are personally, which can come via YouTube as well, to come here. Because emails can be read the wrong way. Facebook messages can be read the wrong way. I'm a big believer of that you're going to showcase it, showcase it personally, encourage and get excited about it. I'm also not a tweeter. I don't think you have to use every channel. You know, I don't tweet. I'm not a tweeter. I do have um, a tweet account, I think. I think I had four people follow me, but they sent me a message to say,
So you're boring. Um, I'm moving on. Um, the other one you raised was China. And Paul, I'm going to put you uh, a little on the spot. You, um, you have a position on the Tourism Australia board, is that? Uh, no, 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 I don't. I used to. You used to? Yeah. Okay. I'm really but I can certainly in... ask you questions about China. Yeah. yeah. I'm interested in the, in the connection that the Red Centre can make with China. The, the latest research from Tourism Australia um, shows that the, the Chinese market that we're currently targeting don't have an immediate affinity with the Red Centre. It's not something that they can immediately connect with, um, typically because it's not part of the education program. They're not, it's not in schools. They don't learn about Uluru Katadruta in schools. Um, they heard a little bit about the Opera House or they might hear a little bit about um, some of the beaches, but it's not something that's immediately obvious to them. And yet we have an amazingly rich Chinese history here um, to be able to connect with. Um, I think uh, if Crafty was here, he could tell his story about Fair Dinkum. If you've never heard it, go to Crafty's Steakhouse and ask him. Um, it's a great story. But talk to me, Paul, about what you see as the opportunity with China. In 10 years, we've seen virtually no growth in the China market into the Northern Territory. Um, how do we start to make some headway in this market that everyone talks about China and still be true to our Red Centre? Yeah, good question, Mark. I think that um, we've had some Chinese uh, uh, people through the park just recently and they've come through through Tourism NT and Tourism Australia. And um, the feedback that we got from those people that came through was very much about they like the personal relationships, they like to talk to people, they like to engage. Um, so I think um, it's just interesting because I know that in Cairns um, there's a real push towards getting the Chinese uh, visitor into Cairns. Um, and they're looking at some exponential sort of growth in terms of the Chinese market coming into Cairns. And the reason why is that, um, you know, they believe that the Chinese market is a little bit more sophisticated than what the, uh, the Japanese were when they started visiting Australia. Um, so they are a bit more engaging. Um, they are, um, from the outset, looking at doing individual experiences, so we're not tying them into a group market. Um, you know... I got a bit of a concern that the Chinese market are not really interested in Aboriginal culture. Um, so uh, in terms of heritage, yes, there might be some opportunities there for us to look at that heritage side of um, the equation. Certainly with um, the growth in terms of, you said, 15 new heritage listed destinations in China. Um, so really that shouldn't be something that we should walk away from. I think that there's a great opportunity for the, the Western McDonald's to be heritage listed. Um, people in the room would start jumping and screaming and saying, well, that means we can't access. And, but that's not the case, and I think we'll be covering this um, in a session at 1.30. So, um, yeah, great opportunities. Um, I've got a big problem with dispersal. I don't think that um, when Andrew and the guys from Tourism Australia talk about visitations into Australia from the, the growth markets, and that China is one of them, I think that people come into Sydney or Perth and they don't disperse into regional Australia. Um, and they won't give us those numbers because dispersal numbers are really key for what we do in a product here. So it's very interesting. Um, however, it's an opportunity and I don't think we should shy away from it. I think we should embrace it. And um, I think there's really great opportunities um, lie ahead for us in the Chinese market. As one of the, of the growth Asian markets, but China is one that obviously, ha obviously have a lot of focus on. Anyone else in the room have um, some success in the China market that they wanted to share? Um, we, we rarely get a chance then just to talk about how these um, markets do fare for us. So who's gaining some traction in the China market? Not yet. So Tourism Northern Territory um, do have a plan um, around growing and uh, increasing the China market and Joanne, I've got to put you on the spot to remind us um, what's coming up in terms of Tourism Northern Territory's activities in the China market. Well, this week we've got the China... Uh, the map, the market, the market activation plan. I think a comment that I'd really like to make to follow on from what Paul's saying, and uh, you as well, Mark, um, we're, very, we're very conscious that uh, the Northern Territory is really not on the radar at all uh, in relation to first-time Chinese visitors to Australia. Um, we know that our strength lies in repeat visitation of those Chinese visitors, those who are more experienced uh, in, in Australia. I've um, just over the last few months, my interaction and members of the team, it's interaction from Tourism NT, Grant and Beck and people who are here, um, we've all been doing a lot, you know, exponentially from small numbers, but a lot more work uh, with Chinese visitors here. And I know we're working closely with a number of the, the operators here. 
the overwhelming feedback that I'm getting from Chinese people here, and I'm sure it's the same that all the team could say, is they absolutely love what we've got and they know it's going to work for their markets over there. We know it's only a small percentage, but what we've got is great. That's important to remember that. Picking up on a point you made, Cathy, you know, we really don't want to be um, a little China. We really want us to be authentic on who we are, but it's about being good hosts. So it's about being gracious, generous hosts and being aware of their culture and what makes their visit just that little bit easier. So it's getting that graciousness around the edge of our product that resonates well with that market. Fantastic. Anyone else want to chime in before I... Uh, Rex? I've got Rex, that's right. I've worked with the Chinese for a fair few years. Um, most of the ones I've worked with, uh, they're based in Sydney. So it's Chinese who live in Sydney and then uh, their relatives will come out from China. And uh, when they come out, then they, of course they go and do a tour. And uh, I'll, uh, a few of the tours obviously come up to here. Uh, otherwise, I'll go to Cairns and wherever else they go. Um, Chinese are uh, a very different market. Uh, they, they do love what we have here. Um, when I do the snake shows, I all love holding my snake, as everyone else does. So, um, but uh, <laughs> thought I'd lighten the day up. But um, <laughs> but uh, they they do uh, they do love what we have to offer. Um, uh, we had a, an interesting group come in a few years ago, which is a different group, and I think they were brought in from Tourism NT. Uh, they went to our place, and they also went to uh, the desert park. Um, I think they spent 25 minutes at the desert park, <laughs> in and out, and it was around about seven minutes of my place, and I had to chase them outside with a snake and, and get their attention, and they uh, came in and went out, and then uh, the whole lot of them were standing by the bus having a smoke. Um, they love smoking, and uh, they love uh, gambling. So uh, I think uh, a lot of the Chinese that have come over uh, originally are going to be uh, uh, looking for the gambling, but I think once we get through them, um, we'll definitely get the ones that really want to come out here. And I think one of the ways we can do that is uh, something like the wolf pack that came out for uh, Fink, and I think they're the ones that we have to look at because uh, China's got a, a billion or so people over there, and out of those, there is a percentage that are going to come here, and we've got to make it easier for them to get here. And, uh, and work on that. But uh, I think they're the ones we need to target and get them in here, and I think we'll do well out of that. Fantastic. Thanks, Rex. All right. We might bring Simon up from AAT Kings. Um, Simon, look at that. One thing I love about Simon is he has a real passion for, um, for the region. He makes a commitment. You've been involved with Uluru Katajuda for some time um, and back involved uh, on a day-to-day -day basis now. So, um, Simon, thank you for... Give us, a, give him a round of applause, and um. thanks very much, Mark, and uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here today for TCA. Um, there's a few recurring themes, and I've got uh, um, quite a few messages that are similar to those that have already uh, been presented. So I might just jump around a little bit with uh, what I, what I've got to say, because I had a bit to say about China. So um, I might I might start off there. Um, and it's a really interesting one. I think I'm sure we've all heard about being China ready, and does it, and I don't. I still don't know. I've been up to China, went to the Greater China Mission. I don't really know exactly what China ready is for here. Um, sounds like we might have that something from what Joe has just said, um, but I think that it's. And I'm, I'm, I guess I'm concerned that particularly Alice Springs um, doesn't get left behind on China. We've got an operated already down in Uluru. They're sitting there. They've working out of the Tour and Information Centre. They've been there for a few years. Unfortunately, I only found out today, they're not a member of the TCA. I think they should be. Um, and possibly, you know, invited as an, honorary, on, as an honorary member if they're not able to do it, because I think it's, you know, it's such a critical opportunity for us. Um, but a couple of other things about, about the Chinese. Um, I'm not really that clear about their, you know, as far as how much adventure they want, but I really do think that we don't want to be in, the, be in the same position with the Chinese as we currently are looking at with the Japanese, with uh, the imminent closure of Uluru climb. Um, I think that if we, we really need to be careful and make sure that we um, come up with, an, if they do want an adventure activity, that that adventure activity perhaps be um, out at Kings Canyon, um, the walk out there. But I think that we need to make sure that we're planning and going into that market with a very, very clear um, plan for the future. Um, I guess the, um, with the topic, the future of the centre and how is the industry changing, it, it is a big one. Uh, it's it's a, a fairly frightening one to think about. Um, 
I, I decided to start off by, by focusing on travellers because um, essentially they're what's shaping our industry um, and their, their expectations of travellers I think is, has been changing enormously. Um, I first came to Ayers Rock back in 1994. I was transferred from Los Angeles and it was a bit of a culture shock and we had 68 seat buses running out to sunrise every morning. Some mornings there were three of them going out and everyone was very happy with that. Today I think if we were to do the same thing, be running those sorts of numbers out, um, taking them on the same sorts of um, base tours, all, you know, all jammed together, unable to hear what the, what the guide or driver guide had to say. Um, it you know, just wouldn't be accepted. And I think that's a sign of how much it's changed. And I think going forward, it's going to change just as much. Um, we're certainly, as an organisation, looking at making some fairly drastic changes to the way we're operating our tours. Um, and I think that that's something that the, the um, greater industry is going to have to do based on those expectations of travellers. Um, and I guess some of the, and it, again, it's been mentioned already, but some of the um, trends that we're seeing from the tra uh, travellers from traditional markets, um, they're very time poor, which creates a couple of challenges for us. Um, firstly, it's getting them even to come to Central Australia, and then when they do come to Central Australia, it's getting them to stay long enough so that they do go away having had those wow experiences that make them go and be sellers of our, be sellers of our destination to their friends and families once, once they get back home. Um, booking online um, is something that's increasing rapidly from, that, uh, from our traditionally developed market, um, which is, it's, it's something that I think um, is a, is, it's going to be a greater challenge for us to have to uh, operate our businesses profitably. Um, since 2008, there's been an, this emphasis on um, discounts, um, and I think that's something we've shaped. Um, the industry was really, really, really concerned about getting people um, to buy their products uh, as a result of the um, financial crisis in 2008, and we need to. I think we've we've shaped that ourselves. We need to get. We need to work towards getting travellers to be prepared to um, not be looking for the, not be looking for the discounted products all the time. Um, that said, though, uh, there are still members of that um, market who are looking for the unique experience and are prepared to pay for it, which is great. And we need to, I think, put more energy into getting those, um, getting those travellers out here because, you know, this is really where some unique experiences are. Uh, the Japanese, I've already mentioned that. That's something that, um, you know, they're, they're out, they are a mature market. They've been coming out in great numbers for well, well over the 20 years that I've been um, working out here. And, uh, I, you know, and I think it's really, really important as an industry that we work to, to ensure that the Japanese continue to come in, in the numbers they've been coming and, have, and having the experiences that we want them to have um, in, the, in the years ahead. I know there haven't been huge numbers coming to Alice Springs recently, but um, hopefully that's something that can be addressed as, as part of the, as an overall solution. Um, with distribution, the traditional media will continue to play a, a key role with its reach and, and impact. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that's going to go away. However, online is its fastest moving and our, and our biggest challenge um, as far as channels that we need to keep up with. Um, and, and it really impacts on us all in, in two ways. The first way is booking, of course. More and more travellers are, are booking. I was speaking with um, Viator during the week and they were talking about the enormous growth they've been having and um, they're surprised at how much of the growth is coming from uh, people booking on handheld devices, using apps. Um, international travellers have already arrived here make, you know, making their bookings. Um, again, quite often it's uh, very short notice on products that have been um, put up on sale. Um, again, that's something we're just going to have to, you know, going forward, if that's what we're going to be involved in, we're going to have to factor it in into our pricing models because it, it certainly uh, tears into yield. And I'm sure that uh, hoteliers for, you know, have the same experience as well where they're, um, when they're going and discounting their products to sell, to sell online. Um, the other thing, of course, um, from online, it's something that uh, AAT Kings has experienced a little bit of lately is um, the feedback. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing. Um, it needs to, it's been mentioned already, it needs to be managed. Um, great feedback is, a, is, a, is really, really nice to have, but if you get some constructive feedback, it's really, really important that that 
be addressed, um, not just addressed online, but I think it's really important as a business to address it in your business and so that you're uh, stopping you know, th th those types of experiences um, recurring. Um, I think on, uh, I wanted to make a point about experiences, and again, it's an, it's an example from AT Kings. In August, we had about 2,500 travellers who either started trips to Uluru from Alice Springs or finished a trip from Uluru up here in Alice Springs. And of that 2,500, only about a third of them were booked onto, or booked through us, um, onto local Alice Springs experience, local Alice Springs experiences, which to me is pretty frightening. Um, but I also think it's a fantastic opportunity. You know, there's you know, 1,900 people in one month who've come in here and flown out the next day or potentially flown in here and then the next day they've got on the coach and gone down, gone down to Uluru. So I think that's, it's a really, really good example of an opportunity. We've actually got these people here, they've come from all over the world and they're not taking the time to appreciate some of what, you know, the wonders that this destination has. And be more than happy to have a chat with anyone who thinks they might have some offer. Oh, in fact, go and speak to Kelly. Um, <laughs> if you've got some offer, if you've got some, uh, some good ideas about things that we can package up. In, I just also want to touch quickly on Indigenous tourism. Um, I think that Indigenous tourism is something that we just have to get right. And I know um, a lot of energy has gone into it over the years. Um, that I thought when it started uh, a few years ago, the hub was a fantastic idea, unfortunately. Um, there hasn't, doesn't seem to have had the stability that, I, that it appears to have needed and I think it would be fantastic if, it would, you know, if there was some way that some sort of a commitment could be made that the hub was, um, which is um, like a tourism, indigenous tourism development for those who not know what I'm talking about when I say the hub, um, like it would be great if it could be you know, committed to for 10 years and there was funding for it and there was resources for it so that we can really make make a difference because to keep doing it for a year and then wait for funding for the next year doesn't give enough stability to get these businesses off the ground. But just as much as we need the funding for it, we need the industry to partner the the developing Indigenous organisations. Um, I think you know there's there is successful stories of it. I've been involved in it back in the 90s with Arlington Tours when they when they first started operating, AAT King partnered with them and um, then they um, were went and stood on their own two feet. Um, we we're a very very successful organisation. There's no reason why there can't be. More, more opportunities for that. Um, whilst not so much indigenous uh, tourism experience, I think um, passion in the delivery of products I think can really be supported um, by improving our training and particularly accreditation. Um, there is a, a great accreditation course at Uluru Katajuda uh, National Park, um, but it, I just think it could be so much better if we were able to get some of the traditional owners involved in that, um, passing on information that you've learnt from someone who owns it and has lived lived it would just just makes it easier for a guide to do you know to do their job and to and to, to feel that they own the information that they're passing along. Um, I was going to run through a little bit about some of the um, large international tourism businesses. I'll just I'll just quickly touch on uh, airlines. Um, obviously again that, that, that one already has been touched on but um, they're hard to influence. It's going to be a challenge for us to, as an industry to, to really get them to uh, deliver the, uh, the flights into Alice Springs or Uluru that, that we're after. But nonetheless, I think that we need to adapt to what they're doing as well. Um, as, as a company, AT Kings, we've made some changes in the last six months. For the last 20 years, AT Kings has had its coaches depart Alice Springs at exactly the same time and depart Uluru at exactly the same time and the same with Kings Canyon. We've started tweaking our itinerary so that we can start meeting people off a differently timed flight so that we can give people different travel experiences, getting them coming into Uluru and connecting straight, straight up to Kings Canyon and onto Alice Springs. Um, so, so again, we're, put, and we're putting packages together that do include Alice Springs um, coming into Uluru. Traditionally, they've come, you know, people who've travelled here have started here. Uh, we're trying to turn that around. Um, and I think, you know, we just have to accept that, you know, we are going to have to look at things differently going forward. And I, finally, tour and experience operators. Uh, there has been a, a lot of consolidation over the consolidation over the last ten years or so, uh, particularly 
um, this year. Uh, ANC Kings has been involved in, in a lot of that consolidation. It's been inevitable in a shrinking market. Uh, we take on a responsibility in being a bigger partner um, or carrying a bigger percentage of uh, visitors to Central Australia who are, who are travelling on tours. Um, and we do take that commitment very seriously. Um, it's something that we it's, it's going to I think it's going to take a little while for AT Kings to to cope with the extra um, challenge that we've got, but I think that it's something that we're doing well. We've got a fantastic team of people working working towards um, delivering the level of excellence that uh, we're committed and determined to deliver. So, in conclusion, um, and again, it is reiterating something that Cathy hit on. We, for us to be successful, we all have to work together. We ab absolutely have to work together. Like it's, it's come up from everyone who's, who's spoken and it's easy, it's, it's easy to talk about, but it is harder to do because it means sometimes compromising what you think is right, sharing information, sharing customer feedback, um, sh perhaps even sharing staff, but we just have to do it um, while we bring the business back. Thank you. So come and grab a seat. Um, I'm interested in the point that you made about um, the the limited sales out of Alice um, from those tours. Uh, do you mind if we unpack that a little bit further? Is that a conversation you're happy to have? Yes, that's yeah, fine. That's fantastic. Um, so from some of the products in Alice Springs, um, give me a bit of an understanding as to why that might be. Is it the timing of it? Is it the awareness of it? Um, I'm interested in what might be behind that, or what has been what has been different previously. So, is that different from where it's been before, Simon? Uh, I'm not sure if it's if it's different. I just did the a quick bit of analysis mm. as I was as I was preparing for this, and yeah. um, I was very surprised at at that number. And I, and I and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the AAT Kings has packaged has like packaged up short breaks, yeah. and we and we haven't and we do include some short breaks that include the day tours here in Alice Springs, but they just haven't sold. And I think we need to approach, find a different approach to, to selling those particular ones, whether it's how we brochure them, whether, you know, it's just, it hasn't worked. Rex, can I throw to you, you as, a, uh, as, as a long-standing Alice product, um, better in the past with, um, with packaging into the groups, what's changed? Why would that be the case um, from, a, from an expert local view? Uh, for our house, our place in particular, it's it's uh, pretty hard for us um, for a reptile centre. Um, we're on the uh, the day break for for AAT Kings, and so the people come to us as part of that. Um, sometimes the group will get there and they're an older age group, and uh, they'll be on the bus and they they're being told they're coming to a reptile centre, and uh, some will say, "Oh no, we don't want to see reptiles." And when they walk out of their place, they absolutely love it. So and I think it's expectation. And uh, I think one thing that has to be made clear is that um, that uh, people uh, know what they're going to get from that tour. And I think that's, that really highlights everything. And uh, maybe I think some of these packages aren't being... Maybe it's not getting over to the people that this is what you're going to see, this is what you're going to get. Uh, they've got to really get the grasp of it. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's what we find out of our place. And when they go out of our place, they absolutely love it. But uh, on the way in, they, they're sort of you know, see it with trepidation. But I, I think we need to take that out of it. And I think there's some fantastic experiences here in town and, and all around the centre. And uh, and I think that's what needs to happen is that uh, we've just got to make things much clearer. Fantastic. Thanks, Rex. Mike, can I throw to you? It's trying to get it and fit everything into a day. I mean, really, ideally, we'd all like them to stay the extra night and actually look at what we have and how we package that and how we put it together is obviously going to have to be amongst all ourselves. Fantastic. Well, we might throw to uh, to Paul now to talk a bit about the... Oh, sorry, I missed one. Sorry, Mike, yeah? Sorry, just one quick question. Have, have you, as a company, done any research on the reasons why people are going to use art for uh, customer feedback or reasons why they're leaving places? But I think that we probably, I think I said, you know, something that I, I would intend that we would now do that. It's something I, I wasn't even aware that that was how big an imbalance there was, um, and it's something that we, we certainly need to address. 
because I think going forward we need to come up with a way of packaging our our products, when I say ours, not just AT Kings's products, the, the products of the region, so that people feel compelled to stay. They're coming all this way. You know, it's such a shame, and it's you know, it's we, you know, we we need to find a way for them to stay longer. Well, it's such a big number of um, people that are leaving very quickly as well. Is that something that <clears throat> you think companies like yours would be interested in actually having um, local product approach you about perhaps packaging up different things that they could do to maybe stay an extra day in Alice? Yes, absolutely. Yep. I was I was just wanted to point out another point Simon made and just reiterate that sales don't don't discount your product. Why would we do that? Value add, add something, find something better for it. And I think that's a really important point. Is um, don't discount value add. Uh, but how much of AAT product goes up into the Barclay and then sort of comes back down through there? Or is there really anything that sort of in through Queensland and Barclay and then down and across to the rocks so that the three are linked? I'm just wondering what sort of tours you have available. No, we – very little. Uh, we, operate some extend, we operate some extended touring. Um, and I think – well, for those who aren't aware, extended touring is a um, – I guess a travel form that's really struggling at the moment. Um, so it's, it's very limited numbers. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, <coughs> Steve Shearer. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm from Thrifty Car Rentals here. And it's really great to see some tour operators up there. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd just like to put a little thing on here called FIT, Free Independent Travellers. Um, and, uh, and we need to remember that there is over half of the people who travel through here are free independent travellers. But I just want to reflect of what they've said up there. You would be amazed the amount of people that fly in and they <coughs> fly in at lunchtime and guess where their destination is at night? The canyon or the rock. So it is an issue that I believe that Central Australia and Alice Springs needs to deal with. So it's not just a touring point of view, it's also from the um, mind you, there's a lot that here that are staying in Alice Springs that night as well, but I'm just saying that that is a trend that we probably either need to react to, um, and as a business, I'm renting cars, I've rented a car, I'm happy, but as a region, um, we need to, something we need to address. Rex, can you jump back in? I'll just make a couple of comments on partnering and things like that as well. Um, we're in a group called Amazing Alice and also Attractions on Stewart, and uh, especially with things like the education market, um, there's several guides out there, and if you flip through the guide, you'll see 20 pages on New South Wales, you'll see 20 pages on Victoria, 20 pages on Queensland, and there was like one page on NT. Now, people look at that and they think, well, shit, there's nothing to do in NT. So when we formed Amazing Alice and those sort of things, suddenly we had four attractions that then went and took another page out. So therefore there's two pages and those sort of things that can really help us. So I think, you know, in some respects we need to get out there and say there is a lot to do and by forming partnerships it makes it easy to go on these uh, publications because you split the cost and suddenly you've got four or five or six or ten people that are, or ten um, attractions that are in these books instead of one. So uh, that means that it's showing there's a lot more to do here. Uh, the other thing is uh, travel agents, they're constantly saying or getting people to go to say The Rock or, or Canyon and, and not even Alice Springs, um, a lot of that's probably to do with uh, commissions. Uh, I go to the Backpacker Expos in uh, uh, Melbourne and in Sydney and every time I go to Melbourne I stay an extra day and I do this off my own back and I go to Jet Set Travel and uh, I do a talk for about 60 of their new students which are going to become travel agents and I talk to them on not only my place but the whole region and I do that for a two hour talk just off my own back because I know that they're going to be travel agents and they're going to send people to us. Fantastic, Rex. Give them a round of applause. Look, that, that's what this... That's what this region needs to remember. I think, Cathy, you made the point before. When we talk to inbound tour operators, um, they consistently say, have we thrown our brochures out the door? Absolutely not. Brochuring is still a big part of the sales for tourism into Australia. Um, and it is that personal connection that you need to make. A lot of the discussions that we had with ITOs over the last six months were around... Where have the characters gone from the centre? We love the characters of the centre. Where are they? Bring them back. We want to see more of them. So props to you, Rex, for getting down there. And more of you need to make sure that you do the same. Paul Archie Nail is going to 
give us a bit of a run through on the desert park, play some soccer on the way. Um, obviously a, uh, a local man, long background in the, um, in the tourism sector and um, recently appointed to director of the Alice uh, Desert Park. So over to Paul, round of applause. Good, thanks Mark. Okay, how you going out there? No, it's great to listen to um, both Simon and Cathy's presentations. I'm going to more talk about um, what we do at the Alice Springs Desert Park, but sort of try and bring this in so that it's more about what we're actually going to do um, rather than what we all should do. I think we all sort of are very much aware of the situation and, um, and how difficult it is. But out of um, adversity, there's always opportunity. Um, and certainly that's how um, some operators started back in the 80s after the airline strike. Um, certainly people like Angie and Peter Reedy started up Sahara Tours and um, we know how well that went. And that was just from an opportunity out of adversity. So I was going to talk a little bit about emerging economies. Um, we've sort of done that to death. I think that um, we all know that the Chinese market is something that um, everybody's looking for. I mean, because of the resource industry and... Um, obviously the growing middle, um, middle market there in terms of um, middle class um, people and, and the actual expansion within that market. So obviously these are people with dispensable cash and looking to travel. Um, the big issue there is that they'll come into Australia um, and they'll get to Sydney and Perth, but the dispersal back into regional remote Australia is always going to be a challenge. Um, and the reason for them coming into a regional remote area like Alice Springs, um, there really has to be some product that actually drives that. So why I'm saying that is because I think that for a long period of time, the Alice Springs Desert Park probably, I'd say, is the major attraction in, in Alice Springs. I don't think anyone will disagree with that. Um, I don't think that we've probably performed as well as we possibly could. Um, and maybe over a period of time, it has been sort of inwardly focused. Uh, my role at the Desert Park now is to look at how we can sort of broaden that out and sort of look at a, a vision and, and be complementary to the existing products that here in Alice Springs and the region and to see how we can capitalise on making the visitor stay here one night longer. Um, people talk about the AAT Kings experience, people going out 1,200 numbers, I think it is, um, 1,200 was it, 1,200 people coming into Alice Springs on a month and... and Two and a half thousand, yeah, okay, and only a third actually um, booking through the through IAT Kings, but the, other, the rest not even interested in doing product in and around Central Australia. And it really surprises me, I mean, as a major attraction, why aren't they coming to the Alice Springs Desert Park? So that's the question I need to ask my management and my staff and say, we call ourselves a world-class venue, my question is, are we? And that's the challenge that we have internally, to look at saying, well, OK, what role do we play in the region and what role do we play in terms of inspiring people to stay here longer? Technology. Mark touched on technology, and I think that that's very important. I think that's a really strong element on how we deliver our tourism experiences in and around the region. Now... Technology is fine. I still think that what our point of difference is the engagement with people. Our strongest points of difference would be the engagement, meeting Rex at the Reptile Centre, you know, engaging with Rex, engaging with operators, developing our skills so that we all are sort of delivering at a maximum, our optimum performance. We're looking at doing uh, apps iPhone, 30% of people use iPhones. There's still 70% who don't. Nonetheless, it's going to be a growing and emerging market. So it's an interpretation that we deliver and how we deliver that interpretation, I think, is important. And every operator needs to in, engage in developing of apps and then applying them to their iPhones and other technology that is being used. Uh, the tourism demographic, interesting one. I mean... Um, we have a major operator here in, in Brendan, you know, the drive market. 
it's a growing market. I haven't spoken to Brendan as, um, as of late, but I wouldn't mind having a chat to Brendan about how that market is developing. Does he see growth there? Does he see some sustainability in that whole market? So that's a market that we certainly have on our surveys going out of the park as the 55 years and over. You know, what's always been an issue with Central Australia is that we're an aspirational market. And everybody knows what aspirational means. We aspire to get there one day. Well, one day's becoming too far away. And there's a whole lot of reasons why people are putting off their travels into Central Australia. We can say that um, the domestic market is, is changing. Mark uh, whacked some figures up there saying that, um, OK, we've got um, the outbound market changing. There's less travel outbound. And that's for a whole lot of reasons. But are people actually spending money on travel? Or maybe are they putting, buying more assets of their own, buying another house, for example, or buying an investment property? Well, whilst they're doing that, they're not going to be spending their money on travel. Nonetheless, there is still people travelling. Uh, Steve mentioned the FIT market, a very important market. And I don't think that should be um, uh, misunderstood. I think there's a real opportunity there. So that then leads into the whole technology thing about information technology, Facebook, YouTube. You know, what do we do? What do we do with our social media? How do we get our messages out there? Tourism Australia is a Facebook which has 3.4 million friends. Andrew McAvoy was up here two weeks ago did a presentation and talked about the power of Facebook. And the images, people are very image driven. And um, what we've got to do as an industry, because it is our industry, everybody's a part of it. If you're running a business, you're in tourism, it's your industry. How do we actually get more images up online? How do we get more information out there about what happens here in Central Australia? So, you know, 3.4 million friends of Tourism Australia's Facebook page. Well, we need to get involved with that, each and every one of us. Product development, big issue, big issue. Is our product tired? What is our product? Landscape. Okay, there's some other tour destinations here. We have Transport Hall of Fame, Flying Doctors, that looks really great. The new venue that looks fantastic, the upgrade. We've got Rex's Reptile Centre, we've got School of the Air. And there's probably others, along with the Alice Springs Desert Park. Well, the Alice Springs Desert Park was built in 1997. And um, I looked at the um, projections from the consultant that actually did the plans up for the Alice Springs Desert Park this morning. Projected 150,000 people coming through the park. I'll tell you right now, we're putting 55,000 through there. In 1998, we had 120,000 come through. Do, you, do your sums. It's not great by any stretch of the imagination. So that's, uh, that's what we're dealing with. They're the numbers. Numbers don't lie. But then you know, I think to myself, well, are we actually capitalising on numbers that are in Alice Springs anyway? Are they coming to the Alice Springs Desert Park? But within those numbers also include locals, the local market, and the strength of using the locals for their networks and for them going out there and saying, let's come to Alice Springs, come to the Alice Springs Desert Park, spend longer time here in Alice Springs. You can do this, you can do that. I really think that there's probably time now for major spend in infrastructure in Central Australia. I welcome the change of government. I'm apolitical. I just welcome the change of government because there's opportunity. We have a, um, a minister who's a local minister. The treasurer is local. Been a lot of money spent on the waterfront up in Darwin. So there's about time we spend some money here in Central Australia. And I'll be certainly pushing towards some more development on the Alice Springs Desert Park, opening up stage two. Because I think we have a major role to play in keeping people here longer. Now, if we can get more activities, 
more product development happening within the park, developing our park, encouraging people to stay here longer, then it spills over and then there's other activities that they can do. I would just like to reinforce what both previous speakers, both Simon and Cathy have said, is that we've got to have a cohesive approach. You know, there's um, working in isolation, it's not going to get anybody anywhere. I think we really need to sort of work together. Um, the role of TCA, what is the role of TCA? How do we pull that together? TCA is a great organisation. I was a, um, a board member of TCA back in the late 90s. It's a fantastic organisation. It represents industry. It's a membership-based organisation. So it's up to us as a collective group to actually foster that and develop that working and cohesiveness within our approach. Who are we? What are we? What is our point of difference? I just think that messaging is so strong and I'll just conclude with saying that whatever we do, it's got to be clear, it's got to be concise, it's got to be consistent and it's got to be well communicated. So, as the saying goes, innovate, invigorate and inspire. Thank you. Do you want to kick us off? Once again, all the speakers were uh, fantastic and, uh, and that was an interesting talk and it was great for Paul to get up and uh, give us the bones of everything. Uh, he didn't hold back and uh, he let everyone know what, uh, what's going on. Uh, and I think we're all in the same boat there. Uh, probably the biggest thing that uh, came out of that for me was uh, when Paul was talking about apps. Um, a couple of years ago, we did our first website and our first website that we did, uh, we did it in conjunction with Tourism Central Australia, um, which was Cardia back then, and they helped fund the website. Um, now I'm thinking that uh, TCA and Tourism NT could probably fund apps for all of us and we all connect them and we can all get on so I think that would be a, a really great uh, thing to do so um, let's hope something might come of that. Um, the um, NT um, government Tourism and the SOTC have actually got together and have created an app called Venture All The Way, which is to cover the Stuart Highway from Port Augusta all the way through to Darwin. So I know from South Australians' experience, um, we've been contacted by the appropriate authorities to get involved on that, and I believe NT's done that as well. So if you're not on that, you better get in contact your local folks and get on there, because it's, it's out there now, it's been presented. How will it take up? Well, maybe initially not so well, but potentially down the track, these type of apps, I think, can be pretty strong for the region. The, I guess what a lot of people don't realise is that it doesn't matter where you're, uh, what type of tourism product you're in, whether it's South Australia or NT, if we don't get people to Alice, none of us benefit. And that self-drive FIT market is huge. Don't underestimate that. A lot of people talk about inbound tourism, and yes, can't dismiss it. 80% of my customers are Australian, and we see 20,000 people a year. So that's all self-drive, um, and we've just got to promote this region because everybody benefits. Um, picking on Brendan in a second. Um, sorry, got you, got you tweeting. Um, he's just, <laughs> just downloading his app. Um, one of the things about that market, say the over 55 market, one of the fastest growing um, overseas holiday takers, particularly in the cruise market. Cruise is one of the biggest sellers um, for some of our biggest outbound um, wholesalers and even our motoring clubs make most of their profit out of selling cruises outbound. So we've got a big competition with cruise, got plenty of competition on the west coast, got plenty of competition on the east coast, international. Brendan, what is, picking up on Paul's point, you asked the question, Paul, about point of difference. What do you see as the point of difference for Central Australia if we are standing down in Sydney or down in Melbourne trying to attract our market to come back up in their vehicles, whether they're caravanning or not? What is the point of difference for the future? Uh, we are an expensive um, destination to get to. 
um, regarding um, uh, fuel because the, we have um, less competition here, competition along the along the along the, along the Stewart Highway. Uh, so our fuel prices are, you know, fairly expensive. I don't think the um, all the road houses too uh, don't um, don't put a lot of effort in, 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 into their own businesses at Wyndham because we like to see um, the, all the road houses in, invest a bit more um, in, in infrastructure to make their places a bit better and, and a bit more inviting. Um, we did have a program about five years ago which. Um, the, the Alice Springs Town Council Tourism um, NT invested in. We had a, a TV program called um, Seven Days in Alice, and we uh, and we got uh, a lot of businesses in town to in, uh, to give away prizes. Uh, they, I think they had about nearly half a million people um, put their name down for a prize, and, and they came to Alice Springs, and then they uh, and they. Um, did all these trips all around, all around, all around the centre, and I think that there's a program like that. Um, in my opinion, anyway, the uh, there should be should be something we should be doing every year. You know, so, so you know because when we go to the caravan camping shows, we try and say to people, you know, th 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 there's a lot to see in Alice. You need a seven to ten days minimum just to see the Alice. Then you've got Ayers Rock and you've got Kings Canyon as well. So you need a couple, you need a couple of weeks. And I think this is what we should be pushing. Um, in our marketing, that you know, that Alice has got a lot to offer, and uh, it's not a, just a day program. And also, I'm not sure how we can get that overseas because you see the Brits and Maori and um, and all the other international people. Just as, as someone said before, Steve, you know, with the, with the uh, they just come in here, they get a vehicle, get a vehicle, and then they head off to Ayers Rock, and then they uh, do the Ayers Rock, and they come to Kings, Kings Canyon, and they come back to Alice one day, and they're gone again. And I think this is where we, you know, I mean, all this marketing starts overseas for the international market anyway, because it, once they're here, they're too late anyway. And this is the, and this we can try and grab them here somehow, but uh, but they've already booked their vehicle, and so you know we lost them. Uh, so all this stuff needs to be started overseas, and um, uh, and that's after after half the battle, you know, to say, well, you know, what can they do in Alice, and what needs to be done. I was a bit surprised to, to see the uh, to hear what Paul said of you know when they f first started off the uh, um, the number of people coming through the desert park and now it's, 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 it's only about th nearly a third of, well you know less than 120 thousand down to 55 thousand which is which is I think it's a uh, indictment probably on Alice Springs and how we're marketing here in, in Alice and, and how we can do things better. Thanks, Brent. Finish up okay, there. That's but, right. okay, but, but, but the sales, you know, you know, you know, when we had the global financial thing, uh, investment, you know, caravan sales went down to about fourteen thousand uh, for for a year or two there. And now it's climbing back up again slowly to about to nearly twenty thousand again. Yeah. It was about eighteen thousand before the global financial. And now it's coming back up again. That's just for caravans without secondhand sales and off-road trailers and um, you know, Winnebago's and whatever. Uh, so, but I think people investments. You know, I think that, uh, I think I think another year or two before we can see people. Uh, there's a lot of people staying in rest stops along the way because they, the investments in the stock market, uh, the dividends that haven't been uh, as great as they uh, as they normally um, would expect. And I think this is people were trying to save money. So people are, are travelling through here, but they're not staying in a town. They're you know just a bypassing Alice and also the bad publicity we've had as well. So we need to fix that problem as well. Thanks, Brendan. So, Joe, you wanted to jump in there about um, what's going to make us special, what's going to give us a point of difference? No? No, what I <laughs> wanted to say was no. how, how we get to that. Yep. Um, and it's in relation to, I mean, the subject of this talk is the future of the centre. The consistent message that I'm hearing um, from around the room and from the different panel members are the need for industry to work together. Yep. We're hearing that from small operators here in the centre and most encouragingly, we're also hearing it from, you know, Simon, the, you know, national operators. Gideon went and uh, asked to see me afterwards to also express that, you know, they really want to get involved with operators here. Now, we have the Red Centre National Landscapes. We are one of 16 in Australia, the best of the best of Australian nature-based experiences. For six years now, um, the two agencies from two tiers of government and our local governments and shire councils and representative organisations in Central Australia have stewarded this program 
and have curated the program in Central Australia. It's now at a point where uh, it's ready for local industry to really take it over and run with it. You have a direct voice. We have a direct voice to Tourism Australia in that process and it's all about nature. It's all about us. It's all about eco. We are perfect for it. Yeah. So I really want to encourage in terms of the future for our industry members to get involved, um, to pull in those national operators to, um, to really drive that process and really take that opportunity for the future. Thanks, Joe. A, a great opportunity, the national landscape. Um, as you say, Tourism Australia and Parks Australia are, are fully committed to that program um, and there's no better time now than to really arc out, uh, eke out what is exactly the point of difference and get that into the marketplace. We've got um, one down the back and then we've got time for one more question before we wrap up this session. Yes, uh, Paul Elliott again and uh, congratulations, Paul, on that new appointment. I guess your uh, golf handicap will take a bit of a hammering now. You've got some challenges ahead. But uh, just just a bit of word of confidence for you. Um, we do get a lot of travellers into the camera shop, invariably there for one day or two. They don't know anything about the desert park and I think that that's a big failing on behalf of tourism in Central Australia. So we've got to pick that up. When, when we give them the advice and tell them all about it, invariably they go out there. So... There is the potential. We're just not doing the job right on the ground at the moment. Oh, thanks, Paul. One last question of the panel. Thanks, Rick. <coughs> Hello, guys. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Ricky Orr. Um, I'm an Aboriginal person. I'm Paulie's brother. Um, I've, I've been running a tour down there at Ranma Valley uh, for five years now. I've had a good, I had a good relationship last year with a, good, with a partner. Um, but just listening to what you all are saying now, working together. Everyone's going down to Uluru, all right? Um, there's a beautiful spot at Ran Valley on the way. Obviously, that, little, that, that, bit of, that road is a bit, bit tough sometimes, but um, everyone goes to Ran Valley and they see... Who, who, who knows where Ran Valley is? Put your hand up. Who's been to Ran Valley? All right. <coughs> like I said, there's that beautiful feature at sunset at the back there... Ah, at the front, sorry. But there's a little secret which is at the back of Ran Valley. This site, it's the occupation site where my, me and Paul's ancestors used to live. Um, and there's rock carvings galore there. All right? Um, paintings. There's grindstones still on the ground. There's flints and shards still laying there. So if you want to work together, come on down. Good on you, Rick. <laughs> so we've just got to remember that we've got great pro people you've got great stories to tell you don't have to go searching the world for new angles you've got to look within and look within this room um, now a few of you did make a promise to me before you went to morning tea that you were going to bundle up a little environmental tourism cluster who actually did something about that quick show of hands all right that's my last warning to you at lunchtime then you better make sure you got that together because I'll be back to check on you Jeff's going to wrap it up but I wanted to say a quick and uh, important thank you to Kathy to Simon and to Paul for uh, for making the opportunity the, the contribution today and I should have done that in the first session so thank you Kate thank you Gideon um, and uh, terrible memory block um, for the uh, for the first round of speakers and Mike of course <laughs> my man here thank please thank the guys from the first session